Dharamsala, northern India. Where many exiled Tibetans have settled since the Chinese took control of Tibet in the 1950s. This group, the Guto monks, have rebuilt their way of life here with the help of international supporters. Like Australians Maureen Fallon and her translator colleague Sonam Rigson. For 16 years, Maureen and Sonam have toured small groups of monks from here around Australia, raising all the money to build this monastery in India. In the time that the monks have been coming to Australia, each year, it's taken us quite a long time to find out, but the monks have suffered from various illnesses. They don't want to cause trouble, and they very rarely will tell you they're sick. But over time, we've realised this and we've found out. Over the last 16 odd years, Morin has always managed to help fix their problem. One of the common problems which they all say is powa, which is literally translating stomach, gut disorder. About eight years ago, we met, there was a Swiss doctor actually in Sydney for, to meet the Dalai Lama. And she said, I recognise what's wrong with that monk. I know what test is required. I know what will cure it. I will take him to an Australian doctor. She did. It was Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori, the bacterium that causes stomach ulcers, is endemic in poor countries. If it's not treated, it can eventually cause stomach cancer. There are 100,000 Tibetans in India. If 80% of them have it, that's a lot of people. The biggest cancer in the Tibetan community is stomach cancer. The good news is that we can now treat you. Maureen and Sonam had an instinct that there must be a connection between the common gastric pain that Tibetans call POA and Helicobacter pylori. With the backing of a specialist medical team in Australia, they're here now to test that theory. How many years have you had POA for? How long? Yes, maybe 20 years. 20 years? So they've brought a nurse and final year medical student, Courtney Harrington, to test and treat a small pilot group of monks. If that works, the idea is to ultimately make the cure available to the rest of the Tibetan exile community. They have just 18 days on the ground here to get the pilot study done. So Courtney can't waste any time. Does the power pain go to your back? Yeah. Pain yes. in back? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Mm. Just here? Mm. Sometimes mm. there. Okay. Courtney and the monastery nurse, Sering, are looking for those monks with the most serious symptoms of power. How much blood? Ah, little specs. Very keen on social justice, and obviously this this project fits, you know, meat to a tea. Like little strings of blood. It's a population that is exiled and refugee, you know, but you come here and they just, they have so much love to give. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sounds like it's something we can help. Yeah. What do you think about this one? With limited testing and treatment kits available, Courtney and Sering have some difficult choices to make. So, okay, this, this guy, Keshi, he had pain since 1985, back pain. But high on the list is this latecomer, scholar monk Geshe Dima. Yeah. 
we're working together, so Searing is obviously pivotal and she'll be retesting them after the treatment. A monk's job is to pray, so in a Tibetan monastery, no medical project would be complete without a puja or prayer to the medicine Buddha. To remove any obstacles to the testing and treatment, the senior monks chant for the success of Courtney's work. It's a thirsty job, and the salty butter tea just keeps coming. To a Western mind, it, it seems like a big leap from chanting a medicine Buddha prayer to a modern medical test. But I found that the monks are essentially very pragmatic. Do you get bigger stomach power? Makes a bigger stomach? Out of 500 odd monks, 65 are shortlisted for the next stage of the project. Lid off. A breath test that will tell the team who's infected with the bacterium. Breath in and go. One, one, two, three, four, five. Straw out. Then what we will do is you'll drink one of this. It has water in it. And I want everyone to pick, get a glass. I'm trying to explain to them that they need to drink this urea substance. And then you get Sonam, who's rather a joker and a bit of a larrikin, going, come on, boys, bottoms up. Drink it for me. It's the closest you'll ever get to alcohol. Good. 30 minutes, so the timer will go off in 30 minutes. <laughs> Half an hour later, the monks waiting outside the clinic are tested again to see if the bacterium is present. In, deep breath, and blow. As the monastery nurse, it's important that Sering be tested too. Two. She joins in with the last group. Four. Five. Good. Thank you. <laughs> but time is critical. The tests have to be analysed in Australia and the results emailed back to India before Courtney knows who's infected. Sending an urgent parcel means a 15-kilometre drive up into the mists of McLeod Gunge, the political and spiritual centre of the Tibetan refugee community in India. At first, the back alley office doesn't inspire confidence. Within five days or after five days? It takes kind of four days, five days or six days. Is there any faster way of... Faster like, way? Yeah. No, actually, this is the fastest way. But to the experienced, in India, there is always a faster way. We're only here okay. for a very short space of time, and we need to have this reach Australia, okay. and we need to have further advice from Australia okay, as to okay, what okay. to do next. So every How moment... How much faster you want? Uh, as quickly as possible. If it can Monday, fly Tuesday. out on Monday, it would be really good. Maybe there is some chances to get more money for yes, I understand. extra payment. Can you organise that for us, please? I'll be more relaxed when we've done it. I understand that. And tomorrow after 10, you can track. track. Fantastic. Mm. It's a huge relief. A huge relief. I was about to fly them back myself, you know, tomorrow. Good work. Mission accomplished. Back at the temple, it's the culmination of a five-day ceremony, rarely witnessed by outsiders. The prayers are for Mahakala, the deity revered as the protector of all Tibetan monasteries. This ritual, dating from the 14th century, is performed to demolish all obstacles on the path to enlightenment.
Well, today I'm here at Gita Monastery to make a black tea offering to the monks. Gita Monastery has a very democratic system and everyone is treated completely equally to each young monk. You make exactly the same offering and everyone receives an equal gift. There's a group of monks in the monastery called the 59ers and they are the old monks who were in Guta Monastery in Ramache Temple in Lhasa, Tibet, who were young, young men, young monks in 1959 when the Chinese shelled Lhasa and they were completely decimated. The monastery of 900 people was reduced to about 90. Thank you. So yes, I do feel emotional. I feel very connected to them and they are part of what makes Guto Guto. Does anyone know why it is important to wash their hands? With the tests well on their way to Australia, the team's focus turns to raising awareness about simple personal hygiene. Sonam comes up with the perfect solution, a hand-washing mantra that takes seven seconds, the same amount of time it takes to wash off 90% of the bacteria. And Sonam's seven-second mantra becomes a hit. My passion for this Tibetan public health program is two-pronged. One is humanitarian and one is political. Humanitarian is, of course, you would like to alleviate their suffering, whichever the way we can. And then my political interest in it is that to regain free Tibet, we cannot afford to lose one single Tibetan person. Eventually, five days later, the anxious team gets a text from the breath analysis lab in Sydney. The results have been emailed, but in India, things are never quite as easy as they sound. Yeah. We've had news from Australia that the results are in, but we're here in India and the internet is sporadic at times. Today is not the best day. It's, it's a little slower than... Here we go. So, hi Courtney and Maureen. A rough count looks like 36 positives and 9 equivalents. So 45 of 65 screen will be eligible for treatment. I see. So I've, I've highlighted yes. the treatment. Yeah. A low count is three. Is that what you're saying? And some of them are 57 and 45. That's pretty serious. That's serious helicobacter. It's a hell of a helicobacter. Am I right? Sure. We're down here because we've just received the results of the tests. Good news oh. that the pilot project has been worthwhile. And the bad news, I guess, is that 70% of the monks um, are showing positive for Helicobacter pylori. Uh, our thinking was correct. It seems that there may well be a connection between power and Helicobacter pylori. And now we'll get busy and start treating the monks. Much to her surprise, the monastery nurse also turns out to be infected. Yeah, I was so surprised. <laughs> Because normally I don't have that much problem with the power, no. If I eat a lot of chili in food, that's, at that time I have a pain. It can help your power. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's treatment day at the monastery. And some last minute help rumbles in. This is Nick yes. and this is Vic. Yes. So there are um, and some more um, medical students from Australia. Um, so we 
found them at dinner last night and went, hey, come over and um, help dose all the um, monks for the first time. You've got to tell them to take it in front of you with water and then go downstairs and get some um, uh, milk tea. Okay, there's butter tea coming up. <laughs> yeah, and there's uh, some tea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the treatment kits have all been donated. The monks have to take a combination of three different antibiotics twice a day for seven days. Good man. Now go drink some tea. Geshe Dima turns out to have the highest infection rate of all. The highest level of H. pylori. Huge level. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just simply like to express on behalf of the monastery for you two boys show interest in the health need of the monastery and it is just a gesture to express their gratitude. It was such a wonderful opportunity to be here. It was just beautiful. I think we've learned so much just from the very brief time that we were here. While Courtney has been treating the monks, Maureen has been putting them to work. In a, a fit of enthusiasm at the beginning of the week, about three days ago, I said to the monks, we need a line of sinks outside the dining rooms. If you can fit those sinks by Friday, I'll pay for them. So right here, this is Friday morning, we have the pipes, we have the sinks, we have the plumber, and it's happening. And hopefully by the time we leave on Monday, it will be functioning and the monks will be washing their hands. While the plumbers chip away at the concrete, Upstairs in their boardroom, the 59ers are looking after the serious business of money, Guto style. They are chanting to invoke Zambala, the monastery's deity for health and prosperity. This woman is an official Tibetan state oracle. In a trance, she's the medium who embodies the female spirit, Yudonma. Her presence and her predictions are integral to the monastery's ceremonial life. As a medical student, and having no idea what was going on, I thought, oh my goodness, this lady is going to be on the floor and I'm going to have to resuscitate her. <laughs> It was only when Sodom was like, shut up Courtney, it's fine, it's actually what she's meant to be doing, and I thought, oh my god, I'm so silly. <laughs> so it's really where you think, oh gosh, cultural faux pas, let's put it that way, cultural faux pas. <laughs> Maureen Fallon knows what it costs to run this monastery. So she's always looking for innovative ways the monks can both create income and serve the local community. Yeah, they can do it. We get a substantial building on here. Fantastic. She can see how a POA clinic can help. There are plans to build a small hospital here, a clinic and to provide a model for utilising this kind of service, this kind of care for the Tibetan community which is spread all around India. Yeah. Very late, mm. very late. <laughs> Instead of a lifetime of paying for traditional treatments, locals would be able to have a one-off cure. It's not heart surgery, it's not transplants. It's something that for around about the equivalent of Australian 
say $200, we can test and we can treat and we can change lives. Geshe Dima, the monk with the highest infection rate, has some good news for Sonam. He's very delighted to have this treatment. Uh, although he's only three days into the treatment of a seven-day program, he is experiencing remarkable differences in his well-being. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And he says thank you with a traditional prayer. It's been life changing. It's amazing. It shows for the first time that all my studying and all my, you know, late nights in the books can actually help someone you know, somewhere make a little bit of a difference. So it's my first taste of actually being able to help someone um, with medicine. So I love it. I'm, I'm very <coughs> thankful. <laughs> make sure those kids use those taps, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. What do we do? How do we do it? <laughs> like a dance. <laughs> Yeah. You want to go yeah. to the airport? Get in the car. Yeah. Get in the car. Six weeks later, when the monks line up on retesting day, Everyone knows the drill. And Sering has got it all under control. The results from the follow-up tests showed that 80% of the monks who took the antibiotics are now cured of the helicobacter infection. <laughs> It's really only through the generosity of Australians, their understanding of who the monks are, the impact of the monks on their lives, that we have been able, in spite of everything, to continue to help them. We're not in this to, uh, to win medals. We're Australians, we're in this to build dunnies. And indeed, that's what we've done. Happy?